many years ago, uh, my grandparents had a tornado that went right through the middle of their home. And it destroyed the home, and it sent the chimney all the way from the top of the two-story house down into the basement right next to my father. When they rebuilt the home, they thought all of the damage and all of the problems um, were taken care of. They assessed them and fixed them. But there was a wiring problem that was missed and that remained, burning, burning the rebuilt home to the ground a short time later. Will you please open your Bibles with me this morning to Genesis 9, 18 through 29. Genesis 9, 18 through 29. This is the word of God. The sons of Noah, who went forth from the ark, were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Ham was the father of Canaan. These three were the sons of Noah, and from these the people of the whole earth were dispersed. Noah began to be a man of the soil, and he planted a vineyard. He drank of the wine and became drunk, and lay uncovered in his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside. Then Shem and Japheth took the garment, laid it on both of their shoulders, and walked backward and covered the nakedness of their father. Their faces were turned backward, and they did not see their father's nakedness. When Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his youngest son had done to him, he said, Cursed be Canaan. A servant of servants shall he be to his brothers. He also said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. May God enlarge Japheth, and let him dwell in the tents of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. After the flood, Noah lived 350 years. All of the days of Noah were 950 years, and then he died. The story that we just read took place a short period of time after they left the ark. But it was more than just a few days later. This was a period of time afterward. And as they began their life in the post-flood world, the world that God renewed, forming a place for his redemption or his story of saving us to continue, we see that sin also continued. There was something there that continued on from before. And it forms a bridge, a transitional link. What came before and what follows are linked by this story. Showing us the problem that existed in the world before before the flood remained in the world after, and it brought severe consequences. And showing the need for God's plan of rescue to continue. Because we all have the same need, And there is only one solution for all people, which is prophesied also in this story. And so it points us to Christ. The first two verses in this section point the reader back to the flood and all of what took place from Adam to the flood. And then the story found in these verses gives us a foundation to understand chapter 10 and 11 that follows. And all of that ultimately points us or gives a basis to what is coming with Abraham. We will focus on the story today, but we will also touch on the next chapter, on chapter 10, and that long list of names that is often called the Table of Nations, or the nations that came out of these three. Both this week and next week, when we study the Tower of Babel, I will make reference back also next week to chapter 10 highlighting the reason for the list of names and also a few important names on that list, showing how they are all tied together historically and theologically. In verses 18 through 19, we read, The sons of Noah who went forth from the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Ham was the father of Canaan. These three were the sons of Noah, and from these people the whole earth was dispersed. And the first thing that we notice here is God's faithfulness. It's referenced here, and he's taking us back to chapter 6, 18 through 19. You see, God had promised to rescue Noah and his family, and a pair of every animal coming into the ark. 
And though we have already read that they were protected through the flood and they have already departed from the ark, this is another reminder of God's faithfulness to the promise. But there is also a shift in focus in these verses, moving from a focus on Noah in particular to his three sons, moving to a shift or moving a shift of our focus to the future generations and what God is going to carry on, what he is going to continue to do. And this points to both God's faithfulness in Noah and his family's life, but also his faithfulness in the future. When God made the covenant with Noah, he called him to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth, just as he had done originally with Adam and Eve. And in this verse and chapter 10 that follows, we learn that God blessed his people so that in a short period of time after they left the ark, he was refilling the earth. And there were many, many people in a very short period of time. Verse 19 tells us every person who came after Noah's three sons, including all of us, came from them. And so we can say there is one human race. We are all originally from Adam and Eve, but now here everyone can trace their lineage back to Noah and to his three sons as well. So all of the diverse and beautiful physical differences that we have, that we see in people today, were present in the genetics of Noah and his wife. So we all have more in common with each other today than things that are different, or that things that people in our culture today want to use to divide us, sadly. This is developed in the Table of Nations in chapter 10, where we see all tribes, tongues, and nations come from Noah's sons. If you look at chapter 10, there is some overlap in the places that the three settled. But we learn that the family of Japheth spread primarily out and settled among Asia Minor and among Europe. Places are mentioned in chapter 10, um, and we see that they spread out initially to places like Turkey and Armenia, Greece and Cyprus, and then eventually on into Italy. With different names listed representing different places and languages, as verse 5 of chapter 10 says. So people like Gomer, for example, represent a people north of the Black Sea. And Javan represented Greece and eventually Italy. And then chapter 10 moves on and mentions the family of Ham, who spread out and settled in North Africa and also in the Middle East. People like Cush represented Sudan. Mizraim represented Egypt, Put, Libya, whereas Canaan, mentioned in our passage this morning, represented Syria and Palestine. Havilah represented Arabia. And verses 9 through 11 tells us that Nimrod founded or took over the cities of Babylon, the Assyrian city of Nineveh, and that those eventually became empires. And then we also read in chapter 10 that the family of Shem spread out and initially settled in Arab lands east of the Jordan River before God called them and gave them the land of Israel. In chapter 12, we will learn some things about this that will tie back, but we learn that God planned to bless all of these families through Abraham. And in 1 Kings 8, when Solomon dedicated the temple, he prayed that all the peoples of the earth would come to know God and would come to the temple in Israel and worship the one true God. We also see that Jesus ministered to Jews and Gentiles, and Paul spent his life taking the good news all over Gentile lands. And ultimately, the Bible ends, and Revelation 5 tells us that Jesus rescued people through the gospel from every tribe, tongue, and nation, showing God's love for people from every corner of the world and his faithfulness to his covenant promise that he gave first to Adam and Eve and then renewed with Noah. But in the opening verses of our section today, when Ham and Canaan, his son, are mentioned, we also see reference to the fact that not only is God faithful, and he is carrying on his story of salvation, caring about everyone. But we also see that sin remained a problem for all of us. It remained in the hearts of people after God judged the world through the flood, foreshadowing our story today, and then the Tower of Babel that we will look at next week, as well as 
giving the original readers in the time of Moses understanding and justification for what they were about to do in the conquest, entering into the land of Israel, the battles that ensued, and then ultimately settling in that land. It gave them justification for removing the Canaanites from the land. Our story opens with scene one in verses 20 through 21. After giving us some context, it says, Noah began to be a man of the soil. He planted a vineyard. He drank of the wine and became drunk and lay uncovered in his tent. Noah may have returned to things that he did before he built the ark, many, many years before this point now. Maybe he had uh, been a person who planted and, and raised different animals or planted and, and raised different crops um, before. We don't really know. Or maybe this was a completely new chapter of his life. But the Hebrew word used for began or proceeded probably implies at the very least that growing grapes and making wine was something that was new for him. Some think this was the very beginning of viniculture, or Noah is the one who developed the science of making wine. But others, like Calvin, think it is highly unlikely that wine was not made before this point, and that that's saying more than what the text tells us. But we know that this was something new for Noah. Wine is seen as a blessing from God in the scriptures. In fact, Leviticus 26 gives a list of specific blessings that are attached to the covenant or being a part of the covenant people of God. And he gives us a list of all sorts of different blessings, but it specifically lists the grape harvest. And Deuteronomy 7.13, speaking about covenant blessings, it says this, He will love you and bless you and multiply you, he will also bless the fruit of your womb and the fruit of your ground, your grain and your wine and your oil, the increase of your herds and your flock in the land that he swore to your fathers to give you. And Psalm 104 verse 14 says, you cause the grass to grow for livestock and plants for man to cultivate, that he may bring forth food from the earth and wine to gladden the heart of man and oil to make his face shine, and bread to strengthen a man's heart. We also know that Jesus' first miracle was turning water into wine, where I'm sure that that was the best wine ever, and I'm sure that he consumed some of that wine at that wedding feast as well. And then we know that he went on to use wine as a fitting symbol of his blood as he replaced the Passover meal with the Lord's Supper. Wine is also spoken positively for medicinal reasons in the scripture. Paul told Timothy, no longer drink water only, but use a little wine for the sake of your stomach and for your frequent ailments in 1 Timothy 5.23. But like any good gift that God gives us, we can abuse it and we can destroy the goodness of it. We can misuse it and turn it into something that God never intended it is a good gift, but it has teeth, and it will bite you if you misuse it, as Noah shows us this morning. Noah did not drink in moderation. Instead, we are told that he got drunk, so drunk that he lost first his awareness of himself and what he was doing. He removed his clothes, and then he passed out. And we see that that was for a considerable amount of time. He blacked out, and then the scripture says when the wine basically wore off, when he woke up or when the wine wore off, when he came to himself. So we see that he got really drunk. This narrative, along with other stories throughout the scriptures, teach us by example, showing us the consequences that drunkenness can bring, such as later on we will see in Genesis 19, where we read that Lot's daughters got him drunk in order to commit incest. And in 2 Samuel 11, David tried to get Uriah drunk, so that David could cover up his adultery with Bathsheba, Uriah's wife. Some pretty hard, pretty ugly stories. Didactic passages like Proverbs 20, verse 1, tells us wine is a mocker, strong drink is a brawler, and whoever is intoxicated by it is not wise. And Galatians 5, 19 through 21 tells us, now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, 
idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness. And he goes on from there. But then he says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And so we have to stop and say, well, why would God include something like drunkenness in this long list of things? And we see here that he is contrasting being controlled by the Holy Spirit and being controlled by alcohol. In other words, too much alcohol affects us in really negative ways. It causes us to lose our restraint, our awareness, our self-control, and it can lead to this other list of sins, both committed by the drunk person and sadly and often in our culture today, committed by other people against someone who is drunk. And so God wants to protect us, but he ultimately wants us to be controlled by the Holy Spirit. And that is why Paul places drunkenness in this list alongside other sins. Because it is linked to them. It can open the door for them. And Ephesians 5.18 tells us directly, do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery. In other words, it's going to lead to many types of debauchery. But in contrast to that, don't be controlled by anything, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. And so we see the issue is not wine or beer or any other kind of drink in and of itself. The issue is control. And this is shown by that contrast. Paul tells us, be filled with the Holy Spirit. The word filled there has the idea of being controlled by the Holy Spirit. This is different from receiving the Holy Spirit when a person becomes a Christian. Or being sealed by the Holy Spirit, as Paul talks about in Ephesians 1. When he says... In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. And there we see, he's talking to Christians. He says the gospel of your salvation, something you have received. You were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is a guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. So in other words, we are sealed with the Holy Spirit. It is something that will not ever be taken away. Sealing happens to every believer the moment that they are regenerated or born again. And it is something that then we are called to seek his control more and more in our life, to die more and more to self, to give ourselves over to his control in our life more and more. And that is what is talking, what Paul is talking about when he says, be filled with the Holy Spirit. We need to pray for this. We need to think about this. We need to ask God to control us more and more and make us like his son. Relating to drunkenness, what Paul is saying is we must be controlled by God alone, not by anything else. So we could take alcohol out of this and we could put drugs into this, or we could put any type of thing into this that can control our mind and our thoughts, control our desires, our behaviors, anything that would turn into an addiction, so he's talking both control in a moment in time and also control that then gets out of control and takes over our life. God wants to be in control of us for our good, to protect us from the many sinful actions that can come and the many painful consequences that can come from this. Noah learned that lesson the hard way. Verse 22 tells us, And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside. And we can wonder, what is going on here exactly? This is kind of strange to us. But here we learn at the beginning that sin often begets sin in the sinner and in other people. One sin gives opportunity for another sin in our life. One sin gives opportunity for another person to sin. In other words, often one sin brings much more painful consequences than we ever thought would happen. In America, we don't really like this concept. In America, people don't want to bear the responsibility for anyone else at all. We don't want to often even call things sin, let alone bear the responsibility for someone else's actions or someone else's sin. But that is not what the Bible teaches us here. It makes a connection between the two. 
The Bible teaches that our, our actions often affect other people, and we do bear some responsibility. 1 Corinthians 8 tells us food will not commend us to God. We are no worse off if we eat and no better off if we don't. He's talking about food here that was um, sacrificed in an idol's temple and that people could go in their culture and eat. And he says, whether you eat or you don't eat, that's not what really matters. But take care that this right of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block for the weak. So if anyone sees you having knowledge that you're eating in an idol's temple, will he be encouraged or will his faith be destroyed, Paul says. Thus sinning against your brother and wounding his conscience when it is weak, and therefore you sin against Christ. So he's telling them, you have the ability to go and eat this food. This food is nothing. It's just like going to a restaurant in some ways for us today. But if doing that is going to affect a brother or sister of yours in Christ, if they don't understand what you're doing and it's going to cause them to stumble in some way, you bear responsibility for that. You need to put them before you. Take them into account before you act. And if we bear some responsibility for harming another brother or sister by doing something we have the freedom to do, then how much more when we do something that is sin? How much more harm can we bring by doing a sin that sometimes we think this is just in private, this is something that no one else sees? Well, Noah might have thought that. And we see that that was not the case in our story. And he did bear responsibility Noah's sin was in private, but it still provided an opportunity for more sin. There's debate here about what really happened when his son came in. Verse 22 only gives a summary of the events, and that is usually the case with most stories in the Bible. We only get a summary of what happened, not all of the details. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside. But we can clearly say a few things, that this was not an accident, like a toddler or a young child walking in on a parent while they're taking a shower because they forgot to lock the door. We don't need false guilt here. This is not something like that. And Ham was no child. At this point, he would have been around 100 years old, married with his own children. So first of all, we can say what it was not. Second, this was not a quick glance where something came into view that he did not want to see, but then he turned away. The Hebrew word saw has the idea of looking searchingly to see, to observe, to consider. It has the idea of direct volition, looking at something intentionally, staring at it, and either staring at it with the intention of mocking, making fun of, cutting down, ridiculing the other person, or with lustful intent. So there is evil that is going on here. And then we see he went out and he shared what happened with his brothers, attempting to spread that evil intent, whatever that might have been. This evil intent could have been laughing at his father, mocking him with scorn in his heart, and wanting his brothers to join in. Calvin said this, Ham, by reproachfully laughing at his father, betrays his own depraved disposition. We know that parents next to God are most to be deeply reverenced. And if there were neither books nor sermons nor anyone talking about that type of thing, nature itself constantly teaches this lesson to us. It is received by common consent that piety toward parents is the mother of all virtues. Therefore, Ham must have been wicked and perverse. How we treat our parents is training for how we treat other people in life. And most importantly, how we treat our Heavenly Father. If we haven't learned how to love and respect our parents as we are growing up, then often that will show later in life, and it will reveal a heart that really doesn't respect people in general. But most importantly, it is training for how we think and how we follow our Heavenly Father. Further, this attempt, this look and searching gaze and then telling his brothers could have been an attempt to gain information or in order to blackmail his father, shaming him, holding it over him, an attempt to usurp authority from him as the head of the family. 
the patriarchal head, to destroy his father's authority, and as the youngest one, to rise up and take that even from his brothers. A rebellious kid who became an adult, maybe filled with resentment for how he was raised, maybe things that he didn't like that his father had done. A man who did not understand the wisdom of 1 Peter 4.8, which says, above all, love each other deeply because love covers a multitude of sins. The wisdom of forgiving another person, of pointing them back to God and God's ways, or when we see them in error, pointing them to repentance and faith, and then wanting to cover that sin, not cover it in the sense that keeps them from God, but pointing them to God and covering it from other people so that they are not brought to shame. In order to help them get back on track, that is what he is referring to. Not self-righteously gossip about them or slander them. This could have been more than that, though. Many scholars think Ham might have been looking with incestuous lust in his heart, robbing his father of his dignity and having a form of domination in his heart as well. And if that is the case, this is a very ugly section of verse. This is in part based on verse 24, where Noah's perspective is that Ham did something to him. His look violated him in some ways, and some scholars believe that there could be action that was there. Others strongly disagree with that. And this further um, is this case is further made because this word did something to him, or this phrase in our language can often have a reference to sexual activity. It is also in part based on the immorality then that we see in him son Canaan later on and they then he um, has children and they go on to become the Canaanites and so this is characteristic of that people group in Leviticus 18 which talks about sinful sexual relations in detail God specifically calls out the Canaanites and tells God's people do not act like them and so we see that this sin progressed and it became something that took over all of the Canaanites who came from Canaan. God specifically calls them out, and he says, none of you shall approach any one of his close relatives to uncover their nakedness. I am the Lord. He says that in Leviticus 18, and so many people tie this in to what happened here. No matter what Ham did exactly, it was a sin. And like all unrepentant sin, it led to spiraling down more and more and affecting more and more people. When Ham gossiped to his brothers, filled with pride and scorn at the least, maybe thinking he would get them to change their opinion about their father as well, by telling them about their father's sin and shame, pointing it out, highlighting it, trying to grind him under his heel, maybe even getting them to join in, mocking him, hating the father, thus spreading the guilt as a form of self-protection to Ham, because then he wouldn't be the only one who did this. But we see Ham did not get the reaction that he wanted. Instead, his brothers, who understood that their father was a sinner, they knew that. But instead, they loved and respected their father, and so they preferred to cover his sin as God had covered them in the ark. Remember, they just went through the flood. They saw God's wrath poured out. And this shows the hardness of Ham's heart to have gone through that and not get the overall teaching that God was giving. But the brothers got it. They understood their father was a sinner. They understood they were sinners as well who needed covered by the ark, needed covered by God. And so they walk in backwards with a garment on their shoulders and drop that on their father to cover him up, to cover his shame instead of ridicule it. And then by talking with their father after he woke up. That is how Noah would have come to know, as verse 24 says, what his youngest son did to him. So they sought righteousness. They sought to respect and honor their father. 
In scene two, Noah reacted to his sons. This was not a simple outburst of anger as many people often portray this. This was not retaliation or revenge on Noah's part. Rather, as God's appointed leader, both of his family, the patriarchal leader, even though his sons were adults, a very different time period, a very different culture, but also as the leader of the new world, he pronounced a legal judgment or curse. This is covenant language or contractual language when he says a curse. Under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he also goes on to pronounce a prophecy. And that shows that it is not just Noah who is meeting out this justice, but God is standing behind it. And God is saying, I am giving my stamp of approval, and this is justice I am carrying out as well. In verse 25, we would expect Noah to say, cursed be Ham, since Ham is the one who sinned. But instead he says, cursed be Canaan. And there are layers of reasons for this. This is not a simple issue. First, with regard to Ham, he was called out. His sin was exposed. He was caught red-handed by the one who had the right to deal with it the one who legally had the right to say, this is wrong, and I am pronouncing a judgment upon this. And that taught him something. Second, in cursing his youngest son, Canaan, it should have left a powerful impression on Ham, since Ham was the youngest son of Noah. Teaching Ham the pain that a father has when they see their children go astray, when they see their children suffer, it was meant to be a merciful wake-up call to him. The pain he caused his father, he was now feeling as a father. It was meant to drive him to repentance and reconciliation with his father. Third, it exposed how a parent's example can impact a child. And it would have caused him to think about the example he had been up to this point. A parent's example always impacts a child. And it's not meant to say that any of us are ever going to be perfect parents. But we need to be people of repentance and faith. People that admit our mistakes to God, and when we sin against another person, admit them to those people and ask their forgiveness. But further, this was prophecy that informed Ham how his son was going to turn out, assuming that there would be no repentance, no change in Ham's heart, and that example would be picked up and carried on and run with. And God knew exactly what was going to happen with the Canaanites. But with regard to Canaan, God knew his character specifically as well. And that's why it would be passed on to this whole group of people. God knew that he was carrying on the line, as we talked about many weeks ago, of the serpent instead of the line of faith of Eve. God knew Canaan would follow the example of his father Ham. And so this is a right pronouncement of judgment. And this was not some little kid at this point either, so his character would have been shown. And then Canaan himself set that example, and it's embraced by the Canaanites. And other people groups who came from him, such as the Egyptians and the Philistines and the Babylonians, all come from Ham. And this is especially witnessed in his grandson Nimrod, whose name means, we shall rebel. It has the idea of he is intentionally rebelling against God, and he knows it. As chapter 10 tells us, this is exactly what he did by building his own kingdoms and the Tower of Babel that we will look at next week. It was a quest for autonomy, for power, for domination over other people, just as Ham was doing, at least in some ways, with Noah. This is an example of unrepentant sin and rebellion. Noah went on to prophesy that his descendants would become servants or slaves of his brothers. That prophecy gave Israel understanding of God's perspective. It gave them understanding of why he was going to remove the Canaanites from the land and give the land over to the Israelites. And it prepared them for the conquest under Moses. And in, their, in that culture, conquered people were considered slaves of those who conquered them even if they were not directly serving them, even if they went on their own way, they were considered to be slaves of them. Since it says in this passage that 
he would be slaves of both brothers, this is fulfilled in two ways. This is fulfilled both when Greece and Rome, people from the line of Japheth, took over their lands down the road, and it is also fulfilled when God removed them from the land and put Israel there. But the theological point here is that unrepentant sin always leads to spiritual slavery. Unrepentant sin leads to serving sin, to becoming a slave to sin. And when people make an idol out of something in their hearts, they worship that thing, and they always end up serving that thing. They become a slave to it. Whereas following God and his ways in faith always leads to the opposite. It leads to, leads to blessing and to freedom that we see in this passage. Noah pronounced blessing on Shem and Japheth. He said, blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. May God enlarge Japheth and let him dwell in the tents of Shem and let, let Canaan be his servant. This easily missed part of the story is the best part of the entire story. And that is because it moves us beyond seeing sin and the consequences of sin, beyond seeing that even the heroes of the Bible like Noah are sinners who are fallen and messed up and need rescue just like every one of us. And it moves us to the only solution that exists. You see, Noah breaks out in praise for God and blesses God for his presence in the life of his son, Shem. And then he says, praise for God, for what God will specifically do. And he says, God will enlarge Japheth, and then Japheth will dwell in the tents of Shem. In other words, Japheth, who fathered the Gentiles, would have his people grow and scatter throughout all of the world, just as they did. And most of us are represented by him. But one day, they would dwell together and live with Shem, who is the father of the Jews. One day, the two would come together into one family. And the only way that that could take place is through Jesus, the promised one. So this points us directly to Christ. It points us back to the promise in the garden given to Adam and Eve in Genesis 3.15, that he would send a solution to the problem that Adam and Eve just caused by their sin. That he would send one who would come and defeat Satan, and he would defeat Satan by taking a wound himself. And we know that that points directly to Christ. But this points forward to a time that is yet to come. It is being fulfilled right now as Jew and Gentile come into the church, but it will be fully, completely fulfilled in the future when Christ comes back, and it is absolutely beautiful. When the Gentiles will come and dwell in the tents of Shem, when Jew and Gentile will be gathered together into one family. And the only way this could happen is because of the one who came and lived a perfect, sinless life, bringing honor to his father at every single moment of his life who then went to the cross to offer himself as the perfect substitutionary sacrifice, the sacrifice that we all should have paid to take away the sin of all who trust in him from every tribe, tongue, and nation. And by that, he would unite Jew and Gentile into this one family. The section closes with the death of Noah, reminding us Death is what sin does to every one of us. But we can have the same hope that Noah had. The hope that rests on God and his promise of salvation, rescuing everyone who has faith, rescuing us from sin and eternal death, and uniting all believers into one beautiful family of God. That hope still exists today. It is the only hope for our world with all the division that is happening and we need to see sin for what it really is in this passage, that it leads to slavery and destruction of all that is good. We need to look for it and root it out in faith and repentance so it does not burn our house to the ground. We need to cherish the gift of repentance and hold nothing back 
And we need to grow in amazement and love and gratitude for our Savior who fulfills this passage and is the real hero of this passage. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your great love for us. We thank you for seeing yet again Jesus on the pages of the scripture, our only hope. Help us to hate our sin. Help us to love Jesus and cling to him more and more every day in love and in gratitude. And it's in his name and for his glory that we pray. Amen.